week, uh, we finished chapter 18, so now we're ready to move on to chapter 19. So if you would, turn in your Bible to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, and let's read verse number 1. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. And I want you to notice that verse 1 begins with, after these things. Now, if you're like me, I want to know after what things? Well, after the destruction of the whore of Babylon in chapter 17, and after the destruction of Babylon, the city, in chapter 18. So, what he's saying is, after the destruction of mystery Babylon, and after the destruction of the city of Babylon, John heard people in heaven shouting, Alleluia. Now, Alleluia is really an interesting term. It is a transliteration of the Hebrew expression, Hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. Hallelujah is Hebrew for praise, and Yah is a shortened form of, form of Yahweh. You see, the Jews did not like to say out loud the word Yahweh. So what they would do is they would shorten it to refer to God without actually having to say it. And so if they wanted to refer to Yahweh, they would just say Yah. So in Hebrew, Alleluia literally means praise Yahweh, or as we would say it in English, praise the Lord. Now, because Christianity came out of Judaism, there was a close connection between the worship of the early Christian church and the worship in the Jewish synagogue. So a lot of our Christian terms actually came from Jewish terms. Words like Amen, Hosanna, Abba, and Maranatha. All of these words were transliterated from the Hebrew into Greek. And when we translated the Greek Bible, or the Bible which is written in Greek, into English, we simply transliterated those Greek words into English. So you had Hebrew words transliterated into the Greek, and then it was transliterated into English. But I want you to understand, so many of our Christian terms go all the way back to the Hebrew language. Now, the word Alleluia is only used four times in the New Testament. And all four occurrences are in Revelation chapter 19. The first Alleluia is for the destruction of mystical Babylon, or we said it, mystery Babylon. It's also known as the Whore of Babylon. So they're praising the Lord for the destruction of the Whore of Babylon. The second Alleluia is for the destruction of Babylon itself. So they're praising the Lord in heaven for the destruction of Babylon, the capital city of the beast. The third Alleluia is spontaneous. It's the result of God overcoming the beast in his kingdom. And they're simply saying, Amen, praise the Lord. They just kind of get caught up with all of these Alleluias and they say another one. The fourth Alleluia is for the fact that God is omnipotent and that he reigns. So they're praising the Lord for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Now, in chapter 18, if you remember, the kings, the merchants, the sailors, and all of the traders, they wept over the destruction of the city of Babylon. But heaven rejoiced. And that's what we're actually seeing in the first six verses of chapter 19. Heaven is rejoicing over the, over the destruction of mystical Babylon, which is the whore of Babylon, and the city of Babylon, which is the capital city of the revived Roman Empire. So if you don't mind, what I want to do is I want to go through verses 1 through 6 rather quickly so we can spend a little bit more time on the marriage of the Lamb. Now, I'm purposely trying to make this a very short message. And the reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to cram a lot of information into one aspect, the marriage of the Lamb. And I want to make sure that I don't give you information overload. So I'm going to give you a lot of information, but it's not going to last very long. But I want to spend more time on the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper of the Lamb, which are two different things. How many of you have been taught that the marriage of the Lamb is the same thing as the marriage supper of the Lamb? They're two different things. They're both part of the wedding ceremony, but I'm going to explain the difference. All right? So let's look at verses 1 and 2. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Now, as I said beforehand, the first alleluia is for the destruction of the whore of Babylon. 
She got exactly what she deserved. She corrupted the earth with her fornication. Now, why in, or how did she actually commit fornication? Well, she prostituted her values and her beliefs in order to gain political power and to gain wealth. And she also tortured, and that's why it says, and hath avenged the blood of her servants at her hand. She also tortured and murdered millions of saints. And so for that, she's judged. She's destroyed. Now look at verse number three. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Now the second Alleluia is for the destruction of of the city of Babylon, the capital city of the revived Roman Empire. It symbolizes the beast kingdom. Now, what's interesting is this phrase, the smoke or her smoke rose up forever and ever, doesn't refer to the destruction of the whore of Babylon. It doesn't refer to mystery Babylon. It refers to the destruction of Babylon. In other words, the destruction of the beast in his kingdom. And the reason we know that is because we're going to find out a little bit later. The beast... And his followers not only are destroyed, but they're cast into the lake of fire. And the scripture teaches that they burn forever and ever. And literally, this is an allusion to what's taking place. Not an illusion, but it's alluding to it, I guess I should say. It's alluding to the fact that they're going to burn forever and ever in the lake of fire. And that their smoke is going to ascend forever and ever. Now, look at verses 4, 5, and 6. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down. And they worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Now, at this point, everyone in heaven is praising God. They're praising him because the beast in his kingdom has been destroyed. They're praising him because the kingdom of God is getting ready to be set up upon the earth. And they're praising him because he is omnipotent. Omnipotent means all-powerful. Where the world thought that the beast in his kingdom could not be destroyed, that Satan could not be overcome, God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful and he reigns. In his sovereignty, he allowed certain evil things to happen. He has basically backed off and allowed this world to go through its sinful course. But during the seven-year tribulation period, God has worked out his plan. And at the very end of it, God is reigning. He is omnipotent, and for that, they're praising him. And they're also praising him because the marriage supper of the Lamb is about to begin. But before that happens, we need to talk about the marriage of the Lamb, which brings us to verse number 7. Look at verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. Now, if you have the King James Version, I want you to scratch out the word is. Just mark right through it. And right above it, has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. Now, why in the world would I tell you to cross out the word is? Because it's not translated correctly. That phrase, has come, is translated from the Greek word, elthen. Elthen is actually written as an aorist tense, active voice, imperative, or not imperative mood, I'm sorry, indicative mood. That means that it has come. Sometime in the past, but the effects are still being felt. Now, we need to understand he's not saying the marriage of the Lamb has come. It's not come at this point, at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. No, it started before the end of the tribulation period. Does that make sense? And I'm going to explain the importance of this a little bit later. But the first thing I want to say is this. You're not going to understand verses 7, 8, and 9 unless you understand the marriage customs from the Jewish perspective. So let me explain the marriage process in the Jewish culture at the time of Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus came, and as we read through the Gospels of Jesus Christ, we see Jesus making certain statements. We see him doing certain things. And we don't understand the importance of those things he said. Or the importance of the things he did unless we understand the Jewish culture at his time. 
Now, because we're talking about the marriage of the Lamb, we have to go back and we have to look at the marriage process in the Jewish culture at the time of Jesus Christ. Now, in the Jewish culture, there was no such thing as dating or courtship. Marriage to them was a practical legal matter established by a covenant. The bridegroom would present himself to the bride and her family with a marriage contract. This legal agreement laid out the terms that he was proposing in order to marry her. And the most important part of this contract was the price that the bridegroom was willing to pay in order to marry her. And then she and her father would actually leave the room many times and they would consider the young man's proposal. And if they agreed to the terms, then the groom would pay the price designated in the contract. And I should emphasize that this price, this price was not some modest token. But it was set so that the new bride would actually be a very costly item. And that was the idea. The young man had no delusions that he was getting something for nothing. I'll be honest with you. If we did things the way they did things back in Jesus' day, no young man would get married. Because we come... Not willing to give any price for, for the bride that's to be. We don't have any type of contract that's there. It's just basically, well, I'm getting something for nothing. And that was not the concept back then. The young men had no delusion that they were getting something for nothing. If they wanted to marry the girl of their choice, then they had to pay dearly for her. Now, if you remember and go back a little bit, this is even before the time of Jesus. We go back to the patriarchs. If you remember, Jacob worked seven years for what he thought would be Rachel. Why did he work for seven years? Because that was the price that he was willing to pay for the girl of his choice. And then on his wedding night, because she's veiled, and we'll learn a little bit about that custom, hopefully, if I have enough time. Then on his wedding night, he drank a little bit too much wine. She was veiled, and then he found out the next morning, guess what? He'd been stuck with Leah. And he went and he was very upset. And they said, well, we have a little custom here too. And the custom is that the oldest daughter must be married first. If you want to marry my daughter, Rachel, you need to work for me another seven years. And so he literally worked for 14 years in order to get the bride or the girl of his choice. Now, once the bridegroom paid the purchase price, the marriage covenant was established. And then the young man and the woman were regarded as husband and wife. When Joseph married uh, Mary, they were betrothed, they were considered to be husband and wife, but yet they were not what we would consider to be living together. They did not do that. So from that moment on, the bride was declared to be consecrated or sanctified, set apart exclusively for her bridegroom. And as a symbol of the covenant relationship that they just entered into, then the groom and the bride would drink from a cup of wine over which the betrothal had been pronounced. That cup of wine was very, very important because it signified the bridegroom's willingness to pay the price specified in the contract in order to have his bride. He was not being forced to do this by his father. He was not being coerced by all of the people in his family. No, when he drank the wine, he was saying, I am willing to pay this price to have you as my bride. And then it was offered as a toast to the bride. And of course, it showed her willingness to be able to accept this covenant. It was also a symbol of the covenant relationship that had been established. Now, after the marriage covenant had been established, the groom would leave his bride. He left her at her home. And he returned to his father's house where he remained separated from her for approximately one year. Sometimes it was a little bit longer. Sometimes it was a little bit shorter. They were considered to be married, but they did not live together and they did not have contact with each other during this time. Now, this period of separation gave the bride time to gather her trousseau and prepare for married life. Now, men, how many of you know what a trousseau is? Most of you don't. Some do. All right, let me just kind of explain that. The trousseau refers to the possessions that a bride assembles for her marriage. Contrary to what we think today, it's not just the wedding dress. It's things like the wedding dress, but also it's clothing, linens, and household items. In fact, today, 
We do wedding showers in order to help the bride gather her trousseau, her possessions that she's going to need in her marriage. Now, I'm going to go a little bit further. I tell young uh, couples when they come to see me that, you know, this is the custom. This is the culture. This is the way we do things. And the reason we do it this way is because it has symbolic meaning. But today, we don't really follow the customs like we used to. So it's your wedding. If you want to do certain things the way you want to do it, go ahead. But let me just say this. The groom is not supposed to be, or the prospective groom is not supposed to be at the wedding showers. That was a time of separation. And if you want to do things according to the customary time, this is a time for the bride to be gathering her trousseau, all of her possessions, all of her things that she's going to need for the marriage. Why? They're separated. Now, all the men are going, thank the Lord, I don't have to go to the wedding showers. No, 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 I'm just saying that's why they don't do that. But today, you know, people kind of, kind of throw the customs out and they do what they want to do. Now, before the bridegroom left, after he came and he presented this contract and it designated the price that he would pay and all of the different terms in the covenant, and the father and the bride, they went outside, they talked it over, they discussed it, came back and said, we'll accept this marriage contract. As I said, they had the cup of wine. And then the bridegroom would leave. But before the bridegroom left, he would make a little speech to his bride. And this is part of the words that he would say. He could make a long speech, he could make a short speech, but he had to say these words. I go to prepare a place for you. And then he would return to his father's house. He was letting her know, and this was the custom of the time, that I'm not abandoning you. This time of separation is for me to go and to prepare a place for you. Now, once he went to his father's house and he left her for this during this time of separation, he actually left to prepare two dwelling places. Most of you have probably not been taught that. He would prepare one at his father's house to which he would later bring his bride. Today, the Jews refer to this as the I hope I pronounce this right, chupa. It's what we would call a bridal chamber. And today the Jews don't do this, but what they do is they have this little thing that they stand under in which they enter into their marriage ceremony. And usually you will see these things at all Jewish weddings. But at that time, they would actually go to their father's house. And they would build a room onto his house. And this is kind of interesting because the more sons that you had, every time they would go to get married, your house grew. Very nice. We're going to find if you had sons, you increased in wealth. Not only did you increase in wealth because they were laborers, they could go out and they could plant. They could go out and they could build. They could be the shepherds. They could be all the things that you wanted to help grow. When you had daughters, they were liabilities. Seriously. I I, I don't mean this. They could not help you to build wealth. That's why in the marriage contract when you went, you paid a good price because what you were saying is, I realize you have done a wonderful job raising my bride. Therefore, they would pay this price. She got a portion of it, but the father got the majority of it. Most of us don't realize that. And a lot of scholars get that wrong today. But that was basically his reward for raising daughters. But the son would then go back to the father's house and he would begin to build on a room. This room was going to be the bridal chamber. Let's call it the honeymoon suite. All right? That's what it was. And then he also built a home on the family land. Because remember in the Jewish culture in Israel... You were given land according to tribes, according to families. And that was passed on from generation to generation. And so he would go and build his own home upon the family land. But he did not live with mom and dad. Why did he not live with mom and dad? Because in the book of Genesis, a man should leave his father and mother, should cleave unto his wife, and the two should become one flesh. So when he went back to his father's house, he went to build two dwelling places, the honeymoon suite and then his own house. Now, at the end of the period of separation, and the only one that really knew when that time was come was the father. Because the father was going to be responsible for the wedding feast, but also he was the one that had to inspect the bridal suite and the house to make sure that they were really acceptable because young men, in the heat of the moment, with their hormones raging, think that this is good enough. And the father would say, this is not good enough. You need to keep working. But sometimes dad would do that a little bit longer because we want this bridal suite to be a little bit better. You need to make sure you do a quality job because this is my house. 
And he also had to begin to prepare for this wedding feast that was going to take place. And that could be quite costly also. So, at the end of the period of separation, the only one knew when that end would come was the Father. That's why Jesus said what he did. Only the Father knows when it's time. The bridegroom would come, usually at night, to take his bride to come live with him. The groom, the best man, and the other male escorts left the father's house, and they conducted this torchlight procession to the home of the bride. And even though the bride was expecting the groom to come, because let me, let me be honest with you, in small little towns and all of these little Jewish villages, trust me, they would look and go, oh, it's going to be time. And, of course, they would know when the father's getting all of these supplies for the wedding feast. And so they're getting everything ready, and the guests have to know when to come. So the bride has a pretty good idea. It's getting close. But she didn't know exactly when. And so because she didn't know the time of his coming, before the wedding party reached her house, there would be a shout, a loud shout which announced her imminent departure to be gathered with the bridegroom. Now, after the groom received his bride, the entire wedding party would return to the groom's father's house, where all of the wedding guests had assembled. And women, this is where it gets embarrassing for you. For all the guys, it's no big deal. But shortly after the arrival, the bride and the groom were escorted by the members of the wedding party, those who went to get the bride. They were escorted to the bridal chamber, the honeymoon suite, the room that the man had prepared for her. And here's the interesting thing. They escorted them there, then closed the door and waited outside while the bride and groom went inside and in privacy consummated the marriage. And then once the marriage was consummated, the groom went to the door. He opened the door. He told the best man, the the, uh, marriage has been consummated. Wow. Wow. This is approximately one year after they came to the actual marital agreement in the contract. Now, after the marriage was consummated and he told the best man, then the wedding party would actually go to where the wedding guests were and they would say, the marriage has been consummated. And upon receiving that good news, the wedding guests remained in the groom's father's house for the next seven days celebrating with a great wedding feast. But... That is not the marriage supper. They're there for seven days. They're drinking the father's wine. They're eating him out of house and home. They're having a great time. It's kind of like Thanksgiving for seven days. You can understand when Jesus went to the wedding at Cana and they had run out of wine and it was embarrassing because we're not even to the marriage supper yet. And Mary said, do something. And Jesus said, it's not my time yet. In other words, woman, don't push me into the ministry. But that's his mama. And he's going to submit to authority. And of course, he does his first miracle, turns the water into wine. But the the most embarrassing thing is they had run out of wine. Now, during the seven days of the wedding feast, the bride and groom remain in the bridal suite, the honeymoon suite. They stay hidden in there. Actually, they stocked that room with enough supplies, with enough food, with enough drink for seven days. And they honeymooned for seven days. And after the seven days were over, the groom came out of hiding and he brought his bride with him. They would make their long-awaited appearance to the cheers of the crowd. Then there would be a joyous meal known as the marriage supper. But the marriage supper was at the end of the honeymoon period. Now today, we don't go through all this. No way. Yes, we still have weddings. Sometimes it costs just as much as what they did. I mean, it's kind of interesting, but today $10,000 doesn't go very far. $20,000 doesn't go that far. Oh, blessed is the man that has sons. But anyway... After you go through the wedding ceremony, you have the reception, and that's where the real money comes out. That wedding reception that we do is based upon the marriage supper from the Jewish culture. Now, after the marriage supper, and this is important, the bride and the groom would depart. They did not live with the father of the bridegroom. Why? Because God specifically said, 
that a man should leave his father and mother, should cleave unto his wife, and the two should become one flesh. So you did not live in your father's home unless you were single or if there were problems in the home. Does that make sense? So, what did they do? They went to their own house, which had been prepared by the bridegroom. Now, let's relate this to the marriage of the Lamb. Because we need to understand that the New Testament is written in the context of the Jewish culture at the time of Jesus Christ. And because our culture has changed so much from that period, when we read about the marriage supper of the Lamb, or even the marriage of the Lamb, it doesn't quite click for us. We don't understand why Jesus did what he did. We don't understand why Jesus said what he said. So when we're reading through the New Testament, it's kind of like, oh, that's kind of crazy. So let's relate this to the marriage of the Lamb. Jesus, of course, is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. And we see this relationship alluded to all through the New Testament. It's specifically stated in Ephesians chapter 5 when Paul is teaching on marriage. He tells men to love their wives even as Christ loved the church. Now, why does he use this analogy? Because in this analogy, Jesus Christ is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. And then he tells the wives how to act towards their husbands as the church is supposed to act towards Jesus. And he goes all the way through and he gets to that point when he talks about the great mystery. She's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And he comes in, but what he's doing is he's specifically stating that Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride. Now let's go back to when Jesus came. When Jesus came as the Messiah, he presented a covenant to us. In this covenant... The price he offered to pay was the highest price of all. He offered to pay the price of our sin. The debt we couldn't repay. The debt we owed. He offered to die for our sin on the cross. Now, in order for there to be a marriage, the bride must accept the covenant. So basically, after her father and her went out, and they talked about the marriage contract, looked at the price, looked at all the stipulations. She would then come in. It was up to her to say, I do. You ever wondered where we get that, I do? She would come in and say, I do. Now, in the case of the church, in relationship to Jesus Christ, the church has to say, I accept the price that Jesus has paid for my redemption and accept him as my Lord and Savior. And then if you remember... The bridegroom would pour a cup of wine for his prospective bride. That is a symbol that the covenant has been established. So the bride and groom would drink from this cup of wine over which the covenant had been pronounced. And this cup was very important. Because what this cup symbolized is that the groom, the bridegroom, was willing to pay this price in order to obtain his bride. And then the bride had to drink the cup signifying that she was willing to accept the price that he would pay for her. And this is exactly what Jesus did before he went to the cross. Turn to Luke chapter 22, verse number 20. It says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, he had already told us that he was going to die for our sin. That was the price that he was willing to pay in order to obtain us. And then he offers the cup of the new covenant, which we as believers partake of every time we do or have the Lord's Supper. And then what did the bridegroom do after that? Well, he left the bride's house. He returned to his father's house to prepare a place for his bride. But before he left, what did he always say? I go to prepare a place for you. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Turn to John 14, verses 2 through 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. That's kind of interesting because we're always told that all these rooms in God's house, they're for us. Is that right? But he says, in my Father's house are many man mansions. The way it's actually stated is if there's already all these great rooms. This is already a mansion. But I have a responsibility to go and prepare a place for you. And the place that I'm preparing for you is not to live there, is it? No. 
You're going to have to leave your father and mother cleaving to your wife. The two become one spirit. So you're going to go there to do what? To honeymoon. So he says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Now, during this time of separation, the bride and the groom are still considered to be married. They've already entered in this covenant agreement. He's the bridegroom, she's the bride. And she's to be ready at all times for his return. And when he does return to get her, do they stay at her house? No. Do they go to his house? No. So where do they go? They go to the father's house, to the place he's prepared for the honeymoon period. And people, this is a beautiful picture of the rapture. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout. Now remember, you didn't come without the shout. That's kind of like the warning. I've told you to be prepared, but you need to look up. Now I personally believe, this is my personal opinion. I, I, I don't know this. There's no scripture to actually confirm what I'm saying. But I personally believe that every believer is going to hear the shout. Everyone that's looking for Jesus Christ as part of the bride, the church, they're going to hear the shout. It's going to be that momentary, Jesus! And then, it says with the voice of the archangel, uh-oh, there's people coming with him. This is the wedding party. Does that make sense? And with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever be with the Lord. Now, how long was the honeymoon period in the Jewish culture at the time of Jesus? Seven days. Now, if you were poor, I have to be honest with you. If you were poor, you could shorten that up. But no one really wanted to skimp on the marriage contract because in the Jewish culture, it was for life. You know, this was, this was arranged. This is for life. You just don't get out of these things, and so you didn't want to skimp. But for poor people, you could go shorter. But the customary period was for seven days. All right? But they wouldn't say seven days in the Jewish culture. They would say a period of seven. It was understood to be days, but it was left open for the possibility of a longer period of time, such as... Or even shorter time, seven hours. But it could also be a longer period of time, such as seven days. Uh, seven days. Seven weeks. Seven months. Or even seven years. All right? As long as it was a period of seven. Now, when does the rapture occur? Right before the tribulation. And how long does the tribulation last? Seven years. So while the earth is going through this tribulation period... We're in our honeymoon phase with Jesus in heaven. Now, after the seven-day honeymoon, the bride and the groom appeared for the marriage supper. So knowing that, let's read verses 7, 8, and 9. All right? Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb doesn't say is come, has come. And his wife hath made herself ready. What is she made ready for? The marriage supper. She brought her trousseau with her. She had everything gathered. She was wise. She was looking for the return of her husband when he was going to snatch her away. So she had everything ready and she had her lamp ready. And when he came, she went with him carrying her trousseau. And actually, that's what part of the wedding party was, to help carry the trousseau. And so basically, she would come. And they're in this seven-day seven honeymoon period. But at the end of the seven days, before they come out, she gets all ready. She has on all her white, beautiful clothing to bring out, to, to present herself. And so she has made herself ready for the marriage supper. You see, the marriage ceremony began at the rapture. And the honeymoon is for seven years. And the climax is at the end of the seven years with the marriage supper. It is held after the honeymoon period. But it happens before you go to his house, your new home. So what's kind of interesting is we are taken up to heaven for our honeymoon period. And then we're going to have this great marriage supper of the Lamb. 
right before. And that's where we come out. There's these guests here. The angels are with us. And we're just celebrating this wonderful marriage supper. And then after the marriage supper, boom, you go to your own house. And that's what we're going to read after we get to verses 11 and on. Where Jesus is coming back with who? Us. And we're going to earth to live with him in his new kingdom here on the earth. And we are going to rule and reign with him. But we need to understand that the honeymoon phase starts at the rapture. And it doesn't end until the marriage supper. And after the marriage supper, then we go to the house that he's also prepared for us. And so we're going to come back to the earth with him. He's going to set up his kingdom. And we are going to rule and reign with him. And then we're going to find out, I'm not going to jump ahead, exactly what takes place after the thousand-year reign with Jesus. Now, this is a lot of material to digest. And I thought it was going to be quick. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I was going to open it up for questions, but we don't have time. And then next week what we're going to do is we're going to study verses 7, 8, and 9 again and go in a little bit more detail because I want you to understand exactly what takes place in the marriage of the Lamb and exactly what takes place in the marriage supper. And then we get to the climax where everyone wants to read about the battle of Armageddon. We come back with Jesus because this is our earth. This is ours. Our bridegroom has purchased this for us. And we're going to reign and rule in his kingdom with him. And it's all based upon the marriage custom of the Jewish culture in the time of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to go further next week and I'm going to show you how Jesus fulfilled everything on different feasts. And we're going to look at different aspects of his ministry. And when he fulfilled certain events and how it fell at different feasts. And we're going to see how this is going to be carried through. So we're going to see all of this in connection with the seven Jewish feasts of Jesus' time.